Okay, we're going to get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful spring day. I know we'd all probably rather be outside working in our gardens, doing other fun stuff, but the fact that you're here, thank you, shows how uh, important this issue is to the residents of not only Columbia County, but New York State. So thank you for being here. My name is Holly Tanner, and um, while not the organizer of this event, I was asked by a group of community-minded individuals to host and be the MC because I've done this type of thing before. This is probably my fourth town hall event. And let me um, preface this by saying that I am not here in my official capacity. I am the county clerk. However, I am here because, again, I was asked by a group of community organizers to help promote this event to provide information on what's going on in New York State with community uh, climate action. And so I thought about it, and just a little background on myself for those of you that may not know. I grew up on a dairy farm in West Ghent, and I have to say my father was an excellent steward of the land. He cared deeply about the land, he enjoyed being out in nature, and he taught me that as well. And I do remember very distinctly going to many meetings at our Omai when there was talk and attempts to move the power lines through the town of Ghent. And there were very, um, there was a lot of very influential and connected people on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, and my father who was working to um, address that plan. So I remember those days of my father's community organizing activities, and I thought, of course, I would be happy to help host this event. I'm not the organizer. This is not an official county-sponsored event. I am here as Holly Tanner, a person, a member of this community, to help thank you. Thank you very much, because I am a member of the community. Um, imagine my surprise when I did see an email um, and, and a plan of action targeting me. Um, I will say, as your county clerk, I did just finish a plan with Supervisor Ron Knott, where we replaced all the windows in the historic DMV building um, through the climate action plan by the county. And so there's now very efficient windows in the building, which was originally built in the 1900s. So we did that. I've also been the sponsor and organizer of the KISS program, which is a free shredding program for seniors throughout the county and the city of Hudson. Every town participates. We just finished up our um, first quarter shredding program. KISS stands for Keeping Identities of Seniors Safe. If you haven't heard of it, um, you should check it out. Again, it's a free program for seniors to destroy, have um, securely shredded documents that shouldn't be thrown away in the landfills um, because your identity could be stolen. But it's also all of the documents that are presented for shredding are recycled. So I want to ask a question right now. Please raise your hand if you care about the environment and, you're, and you understand climate. Please raise your hand if you care about the environment. Okay, good. So we're all on the same page. That's exciting, isn't it? Everyone in this room cares about the environment and what happens with the climate. No one here is denying that. But today you're going to get some very good information because information is a powerful thing. So you're going to learn about the CAC scoping plan, which is a guidelines for towns and cities to reach the requirements laid out in the CLCPA. Now I'm a little disappointed. I'm not sure if there's any supervisors out in the crowd. I know a couple were supposed to be here. Oh, Brenda's here. Thank you, Brenda, for being here. Thank you. We're going to hear about the town of Copake's experience with ORAS, which is the Office for Renewable Energy Siting, and 94C with regard to the Hecate Solar Farm Project, and the Part N, a new stipulation included in Governor Hochul's budget to provide renewable solar wind farm developers with big property tax cuts, leaving towns and cities to make up the difference to cover costs for schools, police, fire. There will also be a question and answer period after each presenter, but we're going to lay out some ground rules. Again, we're all here on the same page, so we're going to be respectful. Just because someone may have a different opinion about how to proceed moving forward with climate change doesn't mean they're wrong. This is America. We're all entitled not only to free speech, which was another reason why we're having this here today, but to your own opinion. And just because someone else disagrees doesn't mean that they're wrong or they're a bad person. That goes on both sides of this uh, particular issue. So I want you to be respectful 
and listen, and perhaps we can all walk away learning a little bit about each other. Okay? Thank you. So, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Daphne Jordan from the Empire Center, who is going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Holly. Uh, it's not easy for you to stand up here because, uh, and as, as Holly Tanner, not the county clerk, and do what she's doing. So um, it's well appreciated, Holly. So good afternoon, Columbia County. Speaking as your former state senator, it's really great to be back. I've seen so many friends on your way in, and I'm happy to see you. Today, though, I came in another capacity. I'm still working for a better New York, but from another vantage point. I now work with the Empire Center for Public Policy. The Empire Center is a resource I used when I worked for my predecessor, Senator Kathy Marchone, and during my own Senate terms. I relied, let's fix this. I relied on their research and reporting because it was data-driven and researched thoroughly I could feel confident that what I learned were facts. So let me tell you a little bit about the Empire Center in case you are unfamiliar with us. The Empire Center for Public Policy is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank based in Albany. We've been around since 2005 and have grown much since then. Our mission is to make New York a better place to live and work by promoting public policy reforms grounded in free market principles, personal responsibility, and the ideals of effective and accountable government. Our vision is a growing economy and a vibrant private sector throughout the Empire State, creating new opportunities for an informed and engaged citizenry grounded in strong local communities and civic institutions. We believe that together, we can realize this vision. We can work for a New York that attracts new residences, new residents and businesses. We can shape a New York that lives up to its name as the Empire State. Our team is made of respected, educated fellows. I admiringly and affectionately call them our brainiacs. Our fellows have each uh, their own specialties, such as health policy, education, labor, government reform, transparency and fiscal responsibility in state and local government. Today, I brought with me Dr. James Hanley, the Empire Center's fellow focusing on energy and environmental policy. He will share with you a speech that he has given all over the state. James Hanley has a PhD in political science from the University of Oregon and was associate professor of political science at Adrian College before joining the Empire Center. He has published in the American Political Science Review and the Journal of Private Enterprise, along with other academic journals, and has written for the Foundation for Economic Education, the Liberty Fund, and the American Institute for Economic Research, where he recently served as an E.C. Harwood Visiting Fellow. James has been closely monitoring how the state proposes to implement the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the CLCPA, making sure that the true costs are known and suggesting alternative ways to achieve some of those goals. We all want a clean environment. That's why we're here, right? But what is the best way to achieve that? What plans are feasible? What timeline will actually work? How do we increase demand without decreasing supply? How do we make up the energy gap in the CLCPA's 430-page scoping plan that they admit to and that will come to be? Listen up and learn. James's remarks will focus on the hidden and not so hidden costs and hurdles in the implementations of the C CLCPA and what it means to each New Yorker, what it means to each of you. So 
I now ask Dr. Hamley to please join us and educate us. Well, that was a nice introduction, so I guess I was planning to introduce myself, but I don't have to now. Uh, it's nice to be here. Thank all of you for uh, taking time out on this really beautiful day outside to show up uh, and, and, and listen to me and to the other speakers, of course. So I'm talking about uh, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and New York's energy future, uh, which I think is, is a very problematic future with the direction that we're going. So to start with an overview of the CLCPA, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, uh, it has a number of tactical goals on the way to its larger strategic goal. And the ones I want to focus on right here are the 70% renewable energy by 2030, the 100% uh, emissions-free energy by 2040, and an 85% reduction in greenhouse gases from 1990 level baseline by 2050. Uh, it's not that I oppose these goals. I, I have problems with the timelines that have been imposed because these are politically chosen timelines that don't really have any relation to uh, either whether they are financially feasible or whether they're technologically feasible. As things stand right now, we do not look as though we're going to achieve these goals unless things change dramatically uh, in, in the next 10, 5, 13 years. All right, uh, I'm going to talk about the costs of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. I'm going to talk about the issues of the problems of reliability and the dangers of not having a reliable source of electricity. The costs. Uh, the Climate Action Council hired some consultants out in San Francisco, a group called uh, Energy and Environmental Economics, to do what they call an integration analysis, which is supposed to plug together all the various benefits and costs of a program and come up with a cost-benefit analysis. And in this case, they, they said that the, let's see if we can figure out how to avoid that. They said the cost is going to be between um, 280 and 340 billion with 420 to 430 billion dollars in benefits, which would give us 80 to 150 billion in net benefits. Now that's great if you can achieve it, right? Um, I mean, that's, that would really be good. Uh, there are reasons to doubt it, but, but before I get to the reasons to doubt it, I want to emphasize what the, this overall benefit is, because this is not, and we've been misled about this. Uh, the, and I, when I say misled, I don't want to say anybody's lied to us. I think people didn't understand. Uh, but this has repeatedly been pitched as the benefit to New York. But it's more than the benefit to New York. It's a global benefit. Most of this benefit is from the uh, estimated value of reducing a ton of carbon dioxide or the equivalent in other greenhouse gases. And that is a global benefit because, of course, the carbon dioxide does not stay just in New York State and warm up just New York State, right? So when I, and it's, it's very explicitly a global benefit. If you extrapolate out New York's share of that, plus the other benefits that are supposed to apply, uh, accrue directly to New York State, what we get is about $170 billion in benefits to New York at this cost of 280 to 340 billion. So it's going to be, in terms of New York's benefits and costs, it's a net loss of 110 to 170 billion dollars. All right, now the response to that is, but we are creating this carbon dioxide, it's affecting other places, so we ought to be willing to pay to prevent that damage. Uh, is this still on? Are you hearing me? Okay, I, I certainly can't hear myself, so I just wanted to make sure it was still going. Uh, and that's a, that's a fair, I, I don't control that, in back they do, uh, so maybe pump it up just a little bit. I, I can't stand too much closer to it because the podium's in the way. Um, so what I was saying is the response to this slide is that we are causing uh, this problem in other countries by contributing to global warming, so we ought to be willing to pay for that. I don't disagree with that necessarily, because my, my point on it is, if New Yorkers agree that this is what they want to pay for, they have the right to do that. That's democracy. But New Yorkers haven't chosen to do that because they've been misled about where these benefits are going. 
So we can't say that they made a conscious choice to pay for these benefits for other places. All right, but here's the real problem. Mega projects. How many have heard the term mega projects? Anybody? We have a few. Okay, good. Uh, as Daphne said, I taught college for about 20 years. I taught public policy and political economy courses, uh, as well as American government. And one thing I really learned about in, in developing those courses and continuing uh, to learn more deeply about policy and political economy was the concept of a mega project, which is, these are projects that cost billions of dollars, take years to develop, and are socially transformative, right? This is the Community uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. In fact, at over $100 billion, it's so big that it's technically called a giga project. And here's what we know about mega projects. They always come in over time and over budget, over and over. A recent example in New York is the uh, just recently opened East Side Access Railroad for the Long Island Railroad, uh, built by the Metropolitan Transportation Agency. 12 years over budget. The final costs are not in yet, but it's somewhere between three and five times the original bus budget estimate. Now, if the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, whoops, no, I don't have a slide for that, okay. If the Community Protection, uh, or climate, I'm gonna say Climate Act, it's easier. If the Climate Act comes in just two times over budget, then all the benefits will be wiped out. And this is the rule of thumb for assessing mega projects, to assume they're going to come in at least two times over budget because that is the norm. Sometimes they come in three, four, five, even 10 times over budget. Another example, now this may seem like I'm being too cynical, uh, but this is in fact the research on it. Uh, this, is, this is very reliable. Uh, only about 1% actually come in on time, on budget, and with the uh, estimated benefits. Our very first real project under the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, is the Beacon Island project in the Port of Albany, which is uh, setting up Beacon Island, an old coal ash dump site, to be a production site for wind, offshore wind uh, turbine towers. It was supposed to cost $350 million. The budget for it has already doubled or more than doubled. It's now expected to cost $700 to $800 million. There are at least 10, by my count, individual mega projects built within the Climate Leadership and Community Act. The odds that they're all going to come in on budget uh, are belied by the history of such mega projects. And we can't even get this first one right, which is less than a billion dollars, so it's not even large enough to count as a mega project. Now, I don't want to be too cynical here, but former Mayor Willie Brown of San Francisco uh, I used to live in California. I knew California politics when he was a big wig, and he's one heck of a politician. He will go down in California history for quite a few reasons as a very effective and freewheeling politician. But when he was mayor of San Francisco, they started a subway project that quickly ran into, uh, became a huge boondoggle. It's years behind schedule. It's billions of dollars over budget. And what he said in response to his critics was, public never should have believed us. You should know better. The first estimate is just a down payment to get the project rolling. If we told you the true cost, you never would have approved this. The idea, he said, is to dig a hole so big that you have no choice but to keep on digging. And I guess keep throwing money into that hole. All right, is that too cynical? Well, over in Connecticut, the Connecticut Pier Project, which is also a wind tower project, has also uh, doubled in cost, and the project leader admits that they knew when they gave their first public estimate that it was an underestimate. In short, they lied. Now, I'm not going to accuse anybody of lying about the cost of the CLCPA because I don't have evidence that anybody's lied. What I'm trying to emphasize is the odds that this will come in on budget and produce the kind of benefits that uh, we're being told it will is not very likely at all. All right.
right, we'll see if this helps. If it doesn't, we'll just blame it on me. It must be my voice. Speak loudly? All right. I, I'm naturally a quiet speaker, but I was trained in theater to speak to audiences even larger than this, so I do have the cap capacity, but then I always feel like I'm yelling at you. So if it sounds like I'm yelling at you, it's nothing personal. I'm just, in fact, my theater director always told me, if you're not spitting on the front row, you're not projecting. So fortunately, the front row is, is fairly far away. I should not, uh, you should not get wet, I hope. All right. So that's the cost side. And, and the, what I want to emphasize finally on that cost is it's not that the benefits aren't real. They are. It's that, like with any benefits, it's possible to pay more than they're worth. And then you're losing money. That money you spend could be spent much better, more productively on other items. All right, let's talk about reliability. What we have coming up in the future, based on the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act and related um, climate law, climate policies, is we're going to have a huge increase in demand for electricity. Two things primarily are going to drive this. Electrification of space heating. It looks like the legislature is going to pass the All Electric Buildings Act, which will require all, that's fine. You can certainly support that. Um, it's, it's going to have the effect of, of increasing demand for electricity, right? Simply will. Uh, and there is also the uh, Climate Action Council scoping plan calls for moving existing buildings to all electric sometime in the 2030s, which again will increase electricity demand, right? Now I want to emphasize, it's certainly fine to support that policy. We just have to be realistic about the effect it's going to have. To do that, we're going to have to create a vast amount of new electricity production. And I think we've underestimated how much renewables it's going to take to achieve that. By some estimates, we're going to need 60 gigawatts of renewable power. 60 gigawatts is roughly equal to 60 nuclear power plants. Okay, it's a lot. The problem is, currently, we are going backwards in total electricity production in the state. Over the past five years, we've added some sources, including some fossil fuel sources as well as renewables. We've taken some sources offline, and we've had a net decline of two gigawatts of electricity production. That's basically equal to the taking uh, Indian Point offline. We're going the wrong direction. And it's not that renewables don't produce power, they do. It's partly that we cannot build them fast enough. We can't get through the approval fa process fast enough, in part because the New York Independent System Operator, which is responsible for managing the grid, has to make sure that wherever these things are proposed, solar projects or, or wind projects, that there's enough transmission to be able to move the power from them where it needs to go. And that's just not the case everywhere. We can build that transmission, but that adds billions of dollars to the costs, and it takes time, a lot of time. And all those costs, of course, get passed on to the ratepayers, right? So we can do all this, but we have to recognize that we're going to have to pay for it. All right, what are the electricity supply risks we have? Well, you can see them up here on the screen. We've been blocking fossil fuel uh, projects. And we've ta we're taking fossil fuel facilities offline. They are aging. A lot of them in the state are approaching the end of their planned life. They're either going to have to be renovated, but that's getting hard to get permits to do. There's a lot of political opposition to it, particularly in the local areas, right, which is understandable. Nobody really wants to be located next to one of these things, but we do want the power. Um, <clears throat> The peaker plant rule is going to be very hard for many peaker plants. A, a peaker plant, are, they're the ones that come on uh, sometimes just in the morning and afternoon when energy demand is at its highest. Sometimes they only come on for a few hours a year. We have some that just kind of sit there on reserve, not doing anything until we get those extremely hot days when we're all cranking out the air conditioner or the extremely cold days when people with electric heat have to turn it up to, to stay warm. 
Um, we're looking at taking most of those offline and those uh, through the peaker plant rule, which makes it harder for them to comply with clean air requirements. And there's a proposed bill in the legislature. I don't think it's make, didn't make progress last year. I don't think it's making progress this year. I could be wrong. Uh, but it will continue to be reintroduced called the Pollution Justice Act, which would shut down peaker plants even faster. If we shut them down faster, then we can bring new electricity, new uh, renewable sources online, then we're simply not going to have enough electricity. It's just a math equation, right? You demand more, you get less, it doesn't work. Um, so just to meet the 20, 30, 70% uh, renewable target, we're going to have to add 20 gigawatts of renewables. Over the last, got to remember my numbers here, uh, since 99, the last 23 years, we've only added 12.9 gigawatts. We're going to have to move a lot, lot faster. And moving faster, as I said, is not easy to do because you can't just site a solar field or a wind project just anywhere and be able to plug it into the grid. You have to have high power transmission lines either there already or a plan to build them. All of this takes time. That's the, uh, this, this map shows particularly constrained uh, pockets. These are areas where we don't have that transmission available. Again, it can be built. It's not technologically hard. I want to emphasize that. It's just time consuming and costly. Champlain Hudson Power Express will help. Um, the big problem, of course, is, is New York. Most of upstate is already mostly renewable thanks to our hydropower plants. Uh, downstate is where we have the most reliance on fossil fuel resources. Champlain Hudson uh, Power Express is the line that's coming down the Hudson River, bringing power directly from the uh, uh, hydro plants in Quebec, I'm gonna plug it directly into the New York City grid. That's good, clean energy. Uh, at least in terms of emissions. I don't know how you feel about dams, uh, which have their own problems, uh, but it doesn't produce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but that's not going to be enough to offset, and it does have the problem that if there's, like that cold snap we had recently, if there's not, if there's too much demand in Quebec, they're going to take care of Quebec first. That's just a given. How about wind? Is wind going to be our savior? No, because wind is not reliable. This, uh, this is from uh, the New York Independent System Operator's real-time dashboard, which you can look up any day and see what our uh, electricity demand load shape is like and what fuels are being used. The ones at the top, uh, the blue is hydroelectric. The yellow one that goes straight across is nuclear, doesn't vary chugs along at full output all the time. The, one, the other ones that go up and down are natural gas and dual fuel power plants, which may be either natural gas or uh, fuel oil. The one line down at the bottom, that's wind. On that particular day, wind was declining right in the late afternoon and early evening. This is the highest peak period of the day. When everybody goes home from work, turns on their lights, starts up their stoves, turns on the TV, uh, and so on. Maybe takes a hot shower. This is when electricity demand peaks, and some days wind is going strong in the afternoon, right? It's not always declining in the afternoon, but some days it basically disappears in the afternoon. Solar? Solar also declines in the late afternoon, and in winter in particular, when we're going to need that electricity for space heating, the sun goes down at 4.30, you're not going to get any solar power after that. And when we have a big snowstorm, I was at a Climate Action Council meeting, uh, I'm sorry, no, it was, a, it was the, uh, the legislature, legislative meeting about a month ago, and there was one uh, speaker who was from the Buffalo area, and they said, if we'd had more community solar, we would have made it through the Buffalo snowstorm without loss of power. Now, I'm, I'm sure this person's sincere, right? But I fail to understand how somewhere between six inches and six feet of snow on top of a solar panel 
allows the sunlight to get through. Solar is great during the middle of the day. Unfortunately, demand actually reduces between the morning and the afternoon during the middle of the day. So that's when we tend to get more solar than we need sometimes. Then when we need it in the early morning, late afternoon, it's not always available. And sometimes the weather just makes it unavailable. Right? We don't control the weather. Just building more wind and more solar, it helps, but it's not enough because the weather systems we get, as big a state as New York is, um, one of the biggest states on the East Coast, right? As big as New York is, the weather systems are, are yet bigger. So we can have little wind or little solar across the whole state. Now, the Germans are ahead of us in developing wind power and solar power, but they've run into a particular problem uh, where there are periods where there's neither wind nor sun. They have a term for it. They call it a dunkelflaute, which means a dark lull. It's cloudy and still. Little solar power, little wind power. The independent system operator estimates that because of these problems of unreliability of wind and solar, in the future we're looking at missing 10% of our needed energy production across the year. Now 10% that's not going to be on a daily basis, but if it was, that would be equal to going without enough energy two and a half days or two and a half hours per day. Or you might say something like uh, 365, 36, uh, about almost two months a year. The scoping plan that was voted on by the Climate Action Council, I'm not sure anybody in the Climate Action Council actually read all 430 pages, to be honest. It's a lot to read. I haven't read all 430 pages myself. I've read lots of it. Uh, I didn't read the section on agriculture and forestry that closely because it's not in my wheelhouse. Uh, there's a lot in there. But in the energy chapter, it says, this is a scoping plan. This is our roadmap for implementing the Climate Act. It says there will be days, weeks, or even longer where renewable resources are not sufficient to meet our needs. That's what was approved by the Climate Action Council. How about batteries? Um, batteries will become part of our strategy. They'll be useful for the morning and afternoon peaks, so we don't have to turn on some of those peaker plants. But right now, batteries have at most about a four-hour shelf life before they have to be recharged. Uh, engineers are working on 100-hour batteries. They will get there someday. I never bet against the technology. I bet against the optimist timeline. Uh, these things usually take much longer than anticipated. But the engineers are brilliant. Uh, they'll get there on 100-hour batteries. But that's still only a three-day battery. And then it has to be recharged. So if you get uh, three days of uh, dunkelflaute, no wind, no, no sun, and then you have a couple of nice days, and then you get another one of those, you may not have had enough power generation in between to recharge your batteries. And I'm still trying to figure out how much, uh, there, there's doubts we can get enough batteries because there's so much competition for the minerals necessary to make them and so much political opposition around the world to lithium mining. We're not approving it in the United States very rapidly uh, because local people object to having these mines in their communities and they do in other countries as well. I'm not criticizing them. I, I wouldn't want to be living next door to a mine myself, but it creates a fundamental problem of getting the materials for these batteries. But at the cost these batteries are, even if they decline in cost, as they hopefully will if the materials become available, uh, we're looking at estimates. Every estimate I've seen is over a trillion dollars, between one and three trillion dollars, to get enough batteries to meet New York's needs. I hope that's an overestimate, and I don't know it for a fact myself. Um, I haven't been able to work that out yet, but these are what some other pretty smart people are working out. So we're talking some huge costs, and frankly, inability to have batteries get us through long extended periods of low wind and sun. Oh, there's that 10% missing power gap. I got ahead of myself on that. All right, I like to think about worst case scenarios. They rarely come true, but when they do, catastrophe can strike. 
This is a map of the two, August 2003 Northeast power blackout. 50 million people lost power, some just for a few minutes, some for hours, some for days. Now, this was August. It was hot. I'm going to guarantee you, we didn't uh, back then tend to estimate these things very carefully, but I'm going to guarantee people died. And it's going to be mostly old people living in old houses without air conditioning. What if that had been winter? Well, how many of you are familiar with what happened in Texas two years ago? They had almost all of Texas had a power outage that lasted several days. This was not because of renewables. I want to emphasize that. Uh, both renewables and fossil fuels went offline. It's because Texas doesn't weatherize their system the way we do here in New York because they don't expect to have the kind of weather we have. This was a polar vortex that came down surprisingly far south. It then froze up everything. So I don't want to make it a renewable scare story. It's a scare story about what happens when you don't have power in the midst of winter. Somewhere, depending on which estimate you believe, somewhere between 246 and 700 people died. Now the Environmental Protection Agency estimates the value of a human life at $9 million. Maybe it's more, maybe it's less, we can quibble that. But that's what they use for planning purposes. That means somewhere between two and six billion dollar loss just in human lives. There was an additional 200 billion dollars in property damage. Now, if we run into that kind of problem here in New York because we're increasing electricity demand and, re and, and not keeping up in terms of how much electricity we're producing, and we have this kind of winter blackout that costs us around 200 billion dollars, that right there is a 70% increase in the cost of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So what should we do? It's one thing to complain. It's uh, you always need to provide some solutions. And my belief is we need to continue to pay attention to reliability. Reliability of electricity supply is job one. It keeps people alive. There is no advanced economy that functions well without reliable energy. If you don't have reliable energy, you're a developing country, or you hope you're developing. I know this isn't going to be popular with some people, but we need to support continued permitting of fossil fuel plants until such time as we can replace them with reliable alternatives. In addition to solar and wind, we need reliable backup. Right now, the only technologically feasible backup is natural gas. Well, coal, but we don't have coal here in, in New York, and for the most part, I think people don't want to go back to it. Natural gas is much cleaner, both in terms of greenhouse gases and in terms of your regular air pollution, right? So that's been a big game for New York. But that is our reliable backup until we develop something better. And they're working on things, working on hydrogen. But that's sometime in the future. We don't know when. It's not available now at utility scale and at anything like a reasonable cost. My big belief, uh, political deadlines are politically chosen because they sound good. The deadlines of the CLCPA were chosen in part because they sounded good to Governor Cuomo. That is, he thought they'd sound good to the public. But he wouldn't be in office anymore when those deadlines hit. So if we fail on them, hey, he doesn't have to take the blame, right? Politically chosen deadlines are unrealistic deadlines. We have to let the technology, its feasibility, and its cost drive the pace at which we advance. There's no other realistic way to do it except to harm people by lack of electricity. Finally, uh, I think we need to be open to any and every low carbon resource, right? I mentioned hydrogen. Governor Hochul's trying to uh, get uh, one of President Biden's five hydrogen research hubs here in New York. That's good. I hope she's successful with that. I think hydrogen's a long way away still, but we're not going to get there if we aren't researching it. And if New York's going to emphasize reducing greenhouse gases, we ought to be one of the places that's doing research on hydrogen. In fact, we are at Brookhaven National Labs, but we want to build on that. And 
I'm also an advocate of nuclear power, which I know will make some people unhappy. There's probably some people here going, yes, thank God somebody said that. And other people are going, absolutely not. But we are experimenting, not here in New York, but in the US and in China, uh, we are experimenting with small modular reactors. These are built to be uh, much cheaper and much safer than traditional nuclear reactors. In fact, some of them are designed so they're walk away safe. You have to keep pumping uh, some energy into them to keep them going. If everybody suddenly walked away from the plant on strike, they would just run down. They wouldn't run away into a nuclear, into an uncontrolled nuclear reaction. Oh, Maybe I need that one too. Okay, I'll just try not to hit it again. Um, I think New York should be trying to make itself a hub for these small nuclear reactors. They can be used in two ways that are really beneficial here. One, you can place them in our retired coal facilities and in any natural gas plants we shut down. Because you already have the facilities there, you already have the transmission there, the high power transmission to move this power. The other is you can locate them closer to small communities, uh, big communities too, but closer to communities, and you don't have to build as much transmission so you can do it cheaper and faster. Now the first of these are only coming online in 2040, about 20, I'm sorry, about 2030, the end of this decade, in Utah and Nevada. They're demonstration projects. We are, like hydrogen, we're a long way away from having this uh, ready to roll out. We're not gonna have them rolled out all over the state by 2040, even if we could overcome political opposition, which again, we need to let the timelines be driven by the technology. But if we make New York a welcoming place, for small modular reactors, that is our best bet for getting to 100% emissions-free electricity, not by our chosen deadline necessarily, but in the long run while maintaining electric reliability. So thank you uh, for letting me talk. Um, it's been good.